Okay, so we're back for round two. So anyway, I went home and I said to my husband, I want to be an Orthodox Christian. So within a week or two, I had called the rector of the Orthodox Church that was nearest to my current Episcopal Church, meaning current at the time, the Episcopal Church where I was working. It was a very high, what we would call smells and bells Episcopal, like high Anglican, Orthodox, small O Anglican, Latin Mass, kind of. I mean, they were in many ways almost like Latin Rite Catholics. But anyway, so I called this church that was about a mile away. And I talked to the priest and he had a great appreciation for music and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And see, what I wanted to do was... I wanted to become Orthodox and I wanted to go to the weekday services at the Orthodox Church, but I wanted to keep my job in Protestantism as a singer. And I had no reason to believe before this conversation that that would be a problem. Because in my previous Protestant experience, that happened a lot. You know, you would have people who were technically members of one church, but they would go around and do different stuff and, you know, um, it wasn't a problem. Well... That priest put the kibosh on that right quick. And he was like, okay, well, you know, you can't do that. He was like, I would love to meet with you, but I just want you to understand. He goes, number one, we're not an art gallery. Icons are beautiful, but they won't get you into heaven. Number two, <laughs> if you decide you really want to be Orthodox, you need to be Orthodox, which means you need to be here at the chalice on Sunday. And I was said, okay and okay. <laughs> so I started uh, attending Sunday liturgies at the Orthodox Church, and I would also go to Saturday night Vespers. And I had a couple um, kind of like pre-catechesis meetings with the priest, but I was still under contract to the Protestants. In most Protestant churches, what happens with the choir, by the way, is they take the summer off. And this was, you know, June, July. So I had summer vacation, as it were, to go play with the Orthodox. But by the end of the summer, you know, my suspicions that this was the truth had been confirmed. I spent the summer praying and singing and reading, and I realized, I realized and I realized that this is the true church. This is the original church founded by Christ on Pentecost. It is Roman Catholicism without additions and Protestantism without the subtractions. It is the church that has existed since Christ founded it. And I continued to believe that, even if I would go, you know, I, I, I went to our local cathedral a couple times, I went to some other churches for various events, and I heard a bunch of different choirs, and some of them were awful, which for a musician is a good litmus test. Because I wanted to be there, and I found myself able to pray, even when the choir was just abysmal. So that told me I am not simply attracted to the beauty of the icons or the beauty, you know, the smell, the fragrance, the aroma of the incense. I'm not attracted just to the music. I am attracted to the theology because it points to God. Okay. So for the next September through late May or early June, whenever Western Pentecost was, I was going to the Orthodox Church on Saturdays for Vespers, and I was going to an Episcopal Church on Sunday morning to do my job. And that was really, really hard, but it was useful, because I, I, I learned, again, confirmed, that there is no comparison on any level. The history checks out. The people actually believe what they're praying. And the people know what they believe. I will never forget, after my first divine liturgy at my church, St. Mark's, which is the church I, I now go to. It's the same church I was chrismated at, at which I was chrismated. I went downstairs for coffee hour, and I met the woman who is now my godmother. And so she and I were chatting a little bit. And in the course of our conversation, um, she brought up the 12 great feasts, you know, Christmas, Theophany, which is like Epiphany, the Annunciation to the 
Theotokos to the Virgin Mary. Of course, there's Pascha, there's Pentecost, there's the Holy Apostles, there's some, um, or Saints Peter and Paul, sorry. Is that one of the 12 grave feasts? Total brain fart. Anyway, Dormition of the Theotokos, the Nativity of the Theotokos, etc., etc. The 12 big wanga wangas. And yes, I know, I know, Pascha isn't one of them. Pascha is the Feast of Feasts. I love them. Okay, but you, do you see what I'm saying? She was rattling off not only their names, but the dates. And how they related to one another and why they were important. And I just went, I think I literally made that face. I just went, I have never met someone who actually knew that much. And then as I met more people, I realized Orthodox people know this stuff. Orthodox people know their faith and they're unashamed of it. They're not going to go beat down your door and try to get you to come to church, but they know what correct doctrine is. They know why it's correct. And they are able to explain it usually pretty well. At least she was. <laughs> so that was also impressive to me. Because, you know, there's no room in life for hypocrisy, really. You can fool everyone else, but you can't fool God. So I began to realize that. And I had to begin to realize that, yeah, by quitting my job, by changing my religion, you know, I was going to have to explain to people, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to be Orthodox now, and the reason that I can no longer work here at your church is because I'm going to be at the Orthodox church on Sunday. And, of course, people would ask me, well, why can't you be both? And then, you know, are you implying that, that the Orthodox church is truer than our church? I'm not implying it. I, I said, I'm not implying it. I'm telling you. Uh, but in a less confrontational way. But the point is that even growing up, what was, I don't want to say taught to me, but the environment in which I grew up, both at home and at the various churches, was we worship this way. The church down the road does it this way, but they're both equally valid and it's rude to believe otherwise, or it's arrogant to believe otherwise. Well, not so much, not really, no. Not for me as a catechumen or as a future catechumen. I had made the decision that I believe that this is the true church. And that it has the fullness of God's revealed presence to humankind. And so because I believe that, I am obligated, joyfully obligated, to become a sacramental participant in that. So fortunately, I was able to keep most of those conversations fairly, you know, civil. You know, I don't like offending people. I didn't want to offend people. I didn't want to hurt people's feelings. Uh, I didn't want them to think that I was like somehow mad at them and I was leaving because of that. But that was difficult. Very, very difficult. Um, kind of difficult to tell my parents, too. Especially my dad. My dad was not happy initially because he kind of... I don't know if he still venerates Martin Luther, but he did. Like, it was, it was hardcore. So we actually didn't speak for like three or four months once because he was upset uh, at my objections to some of Luther's thought. But I remember the most joyful day when I finally was officially free of the Episcopal Church and I showed up at St. Mark's, my church. And I no longer had to have one foot in two oceans. And I remember just standing there and I wasn't singing with the choir very much at that point because I was, I was new. And I just remember hearing them launch into Bless the Lord, O My Soul in Tone One. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, blessed art thou, oh Lord. It's, it's, the, it's at the beginning of the Sunday Divine Liturgy on most days. And I was just so joyful. I felt so light. Because I was no longer living in hypocrisy like that. I now was on the road officially to becoming a member of the church. And, you know, hypocrisy, living, living hypocritically, 
you know, when your conscience is convicting you, it's, it takes a lot of energy out of you. It really does. It was emotionally exhausting, psychologically exhausting. And so for me to just feel like I was home, to know that I was home, was indescribable. That was about eight years ago. I was chrismated on, that means received into the church officially by the anointing of the oil. I was baptized as an infant in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so I did not need to be rebaptized. Some Orthodox do rebaptize, but my the priest at the time didn't. So, um, it's been about eight years, and since then, my conviction that this is the true church, the original church, the one holy Catholic apostolic church, has only gotten far deeper. And I think the best advice I could give someone who is even mildly curious is go and see. Go to an Orthodox service. If you don't speak Russian or you don't speak Greek, it doesn't matter. Look up Orthodox Church in America. All of our services are in English. Because it's very important that the services be in a language that people can understand. We are all one Orthodox Church, regardless of language. So, for example, if I were on vacation and I wanted to receive communion at a Greek Orthodox church, I could. But who was it that said, oh, some saint, of course I can't think of it now. The Orthodox church does not, what was it? It does not have uniformity, but blossoms with many and diverse flowers, meaning course the doctrine is uniform but that each region each country each language expresses its orthodoxy in in its own way that there's no kind of dogmatic cookie cutter that you must wrench your worship into so for example different musical systems you know, the Byzantines use a completely different musical alphabet, different musical vocabulary than the Slavs or the Greeks. Go and see. Orthodox Church in America. You're not going to be the only visitor there, by the way. You know, don't expect that you're going to know what to do. I think I made a video called Know Before You Go. Um... You're not going to know much about what anything is going on. You're not going to know what to do. And that's fine. Just stand there and pray. You know, we love visitors. We love converts. So if somebody realizes that, that you are a visitor, you know, they'll probably come over to you and introduce themselves and they might be able to give you a service book that you could look through. But I would actually save that for later. Don't stand there with your nose in a book. Just stand there with the people and pray. And wear comfortable shoes. You're going to be standing for a long time. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure that I have more to say on this topic, but time constraints. Tempest Fugit. So, I hope that that was helpful in some way. It's so hard to talk about it accurately, though, just because you, you just have to experience it. And it's completely unlike anything else in the world. And I think that if, if you are ready to learn the truth, if you really want to know the truth, if you are really ready to give up your comfort for the sake of the truth, you know, it, it may be a Damascus Road experience. The scales may fall from your eyes and the scales may fall from your heart, which is even more important. Anyway, I'm out of time. Be assured of my prayers. Please pray for me. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Link is in the annotation. I love the technical terms. Anyway, God bless you. I will see you guys in the next clip.